Normally, the second lesson would be read now. However, uh, I'm going to delay it just a bit uh, into the sermon. The title of the sermon is Weight Watchers. Which is an odd thing to call a sermon on the Sunday after Thanksgiving and uh, a few weeks before Christmas. However, uh, we at Advent are waiting and watching for the renewal of the coming of the Christ child. And there's great expectation for Jesus' return as He promised that He would. Uh, by human time it's been quite a while. But according to the Scripture, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years like a day, so it really hasn't been that long. No one knows when this is going to happen. In fact, we're in good company not knowing when it's going to happen. Uh, Jesus said that the angels in heaven didn't know, and even the Son of Man didn't know, only the Father knows. So we're to wait and watch, and that's what we're doing. Uh, the scripture that Don read is the principal scripture I'm using for the sermon today. And it comes from a portion of Isaiah that scholars believe was uh, spoken and written during the time when the Israelites were returning home from Babylonian captivity over a span of approximately 15 years. They were coming home, I'm sure, rejoicing. They had heard the stories of the beauty of Jerusalem and of the temple. They'd also heard the stories of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and that's why they were in Babylon. But it seems to me that human nature would have focused on the glory days and not so much on the destructed days. They had expectations, but when they arrived, things were still a mess. It took many years to get the city of Jerusalem, its walls and its temple, rebuilt and in good order. The people were frustrated, and they were living among uh, people in the villages around that they didn't trust. And the people in those villages didn't trust or like them either. So it's very uncomfortable. And in this time of discomfort, they, the prophet Isaiah speaking on behalf of the people to God is using apocalyptic language in asking that God would move mightily on their behalf. What they wanted was boom. Boom is about what we want any time that we feel that we're in trouble and need to be removed from that difficulty. What we would like to have is shock and awe and get it done and let's get out of this mess. And so that's what they wanted. But that's not what they got. Many years later what they got, uh, I think of one of the Christmas hymns that has the line, no crying did he make. I'm sure baby Jesus cried as much as any other baby, but what they got wasn't shock and awe. It was God incarnate coming as a baby. When we're in trouble, what we want is a Savior, a dynamic Savior, one who would rescue us outright. But what we most often get from God is we're in this together. Behold, I'm with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I am with you. So in our passage of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 64, there are the first three verses that begin asking that God would break through the sound barrier, would tear things up, would scare people, would come with such crackling heat as the sticks that burn to make water boil, that God would come in a way that would change everything right now. And so the appeal, the cry was made to God. 
In the fourth verse of this chapter, there's a radical change. And there is a quiet word about God, Israel's one God, our one God. And that is that this one God is unlike any other God. Nobody had ever heard of a God like Israel's God. Because this God was one who worked for those who waited for him. Now, waiting in Scripture is different than waiting in someone's office for your turn. I've waited in offices for my turn, especially medical offices, and then escorted into a smaller room with nobody around and nothing really interesting to read and continued my wait. It's not like that. And, and I, please, doctors here, don't despair. I, I have been very blessed when the doctors did come in. Uh, and. And I'm just, I'm standing here today because of the blessing of many physicians. But biblical waiting is not that kind of waiting. It's not being that kind of patient. Biblical waiting and patience is one of expectant hope. It's an attitude of knowing that our God is living and concerned about us and true to God's Word, God's promises come about. There's a special kind of waiting. God works for those who expectantly, hopefully, are waiting upon the Lord. And then another verse says that you meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. And there's another special word right here. The word is remember. Now, I can remember, uh, as time goes by, less and less things, by the way. Uh, my dad said that one of the things that improves with age is forgetfulness. <laughs> so, uh, those who behave in a way that remembers the ways of the Lord are blessed. So this kind of remember has to do with remembering, putting things back together. Um, it's the way God remembers when the people who were captive in Egypt cried out to God. God told Moses he heard the people and he remembered his covenant. It wasn't like, oh yeah, there's that covenant. Remembering meant it was hot. It was happening now. It was vital. It is a word of God that is taking form and action. He remembered his covenant. You remember what happened when he remembered his covenant? They were set free. So those who participate in the way that the Lord guides one's life, remembering those ways, putting that together, God works with people like that. Then the next verse says, we are, our best is none too good. We have all become like one who is unclean, and our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. The best we can do is like filthy rags. But there's a comparison here. Righteousness, another good biblical word, righteousness not only means one that has the right to be in the presence of the king or a, a beautiful righteous room like this, but righteousness has to do with activity. It's almost always an active verb. In the Old Testament, it's righteousnesses. It's good deeds. And so those, we're doing our good deeds. And the very best good deeds, righteousnesses, you and I can do as compared to the holiness of God 
or as filthy rags. Nothing we can do puts us in right standing with God. We're like uh, the autumn leaves. Our own wickedness drains the life out of our being. The leaves didn't weigh much anyway, but as the moisture has evaporated out of the leaves and they have become, in, in our case here in South Louisiana, brown mostly, but as the leaves have changed their color and lost their life, they fall and flutter down. The wind can take them away. Iniquity works that way in our lives. When we participate in unholy behavior, when we let our minds stay in an area that is not focused on the wonders of God's presence, when, when we worry about things, and then to put it another way, it saps our energy, it takes our life, takes our time, and we become, according to Isaiah, uh, the wickedness we have causes us to be as leaves that get blown away. Uh, the next verse is, a, is very depressing. The people around Isaiah had reached the place where they were no longer calling on God, according to this passage. And that happens to us sometimes. When we look at our problems and study that issue rather than looking to God who is the resolution of all issues, then we aren't calling on his name. The, the name, uh, that's another special word in Scripture, name. The name of a person for the Hebrews and for many other tribes on the earth, the name of a person or a place or an event described that person, place, or event. These people were so depressed they weren't calling on the name of God. That happens to us sometimes. They could have called perhaps on the name of God that no one really knows how to pronounce anymore because no one would say it, and that's Yahweh or Yahweh. It's uh, difficult to pronounce, but they were afraid to say it because of a tradition that if you said someone's name, they'd show up. You've probably noticed that, speaking of the devil. But they were afraid to speak of God because if God showed up, they at least were aware of their own unrighteousness and fallen state they figured if God showed up, they'd die on the spot. And so they wouldn't say his name. They'd say Adonai, which is Lord, a, a beautiful substitute. But the people weren't calling on another name of God, a name that Isaiah mentions early in his book, the name Emmanuel, God with us. Maybe my favorite name of God, Emmanuel. God with us. They were so down in the dumps they wouldn't call or think to call on God with us. They no longer believed God was with us. In fact, maybe God was hiding. There's kind of a chicken and egg thing that goes on here in that the scripture says you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself we transgressed sounds backwards to me but that was the perception I think that God not so much was hiding God's self as the people stopped looking I know that when, when I stop looking for God or to God, that's the time when I get involved in my iniquity. And so the people of God, 
I believe, stopped looking, and the iniquity grew. There was no one calling on the name of God. He'd hidden his face. They were delivered into the hands of their iniquity. Next verse says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. What a wonderful image, God our parent. When, when the Holy Spirit brings me under conviction of something I've said or, or done, the one person I'm really not wanting to see would be God. It's, uh, it's, I was that way as a child. Uh, when I did something I knew was wrong, the one person I didn't want to see usually was my mom. Uh, because dad was working out of the house most of the time. And so we get caught up in our iniquity and don't call on the Lord. And yet the picture here is of a compassionate parent. Oh Lord, you are our father. And so we are called to pray to the one who cares, who has brought us here, who has nurtured us through these years whose heart is full of grace and mercy and forgiveness. This God is one referred to as a potter who molds clay in the design the potter would have it. And we, the church, are that malleable clay. Remember comes up again in the last verse of this small pericope. Do not be exceedingly angry O Lord, and do not remember our iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. To remember the iniquity, back to using remember as something that is hot and live and present. <clears throat> we do the same thing. In this way, we're, uh, it's unhealthy. But have you ever worried over something over and over? Someone has slighted you. It, it, they at least could have apologized. And it just gets, it, it's a, well, I'm still wearing boots. So it's just a burr under your saddle. It stays with you. And, and it's live. It's a... It's just as present as if it hadn't been done 20 years ago. When you think about it and stew over it. So that's what they are appealing to God. Isaiah is appealing to God to don't stew over my iniquities. Please don't keep recalling that stuff. And then the last line of this short passage is asking God to consider that we're all God's people. We're in this season of Advent. And it's a season of waiting and, and watching. Uh, as children, we are looking, looking forward to what may happen at Christmas or Christmas Eve, uh, a time that w is expectant and wonderful. We're in a season of looking forward Trying to draw a parallel between this time of Isaiah's passage and today, these thoughts came to mind. We live in what theologians refer to as a post-Christian nation. We live in what is often called post-modern. In fact, I've heard it called post-postmodern. My English understanding doesn't work because I think modern means contemporary, and how can you be past that unless you're in science fiction? So I, I just have a problem. But anyway, we live in this, it's supposed to bring depression. We are no longer modern, we're past that, postmodern. We live in a time of deconstruction of all the stuff that we thought we believed and thought was current and true and right, and now it's not. Some people don't even believe in climate change. We live in a country 
that was beautifully designed as a representative democracy. And now I would think most of us are concerned that it has become dysfunctional gridlock. We are living in a time where we don't like to think about it, but financial collapse is one of the things that possibly looms in our future, maybe even sooner than later. It's a cataclysmic threat. I hope that's all it is. We live in a time when the social fabric has not only become frayed, but is strained at times to a breaking point. We are living in a country and in a time where injustice is around. And it's always been around, but it now is headline injustice and becomes reason for protest or worse. We're living in the, these United States when there is great division among us. We're blessed in this church that whatever disagreements we may have, and I'm sure there are as many disagreements among us as there are people, if not more, are covered over by the grace and love of Christ. And so the environment here is healthy and not toxic as it could have been. We live in a world of unrest with wars and rumors of wars, with terrorists who have already reached our shores, with concern that it may happen again, with a tension between liberty and security. There are doomsayers on the right and on the left. Well, God, how long? Would that you would tear open the sky and come down the way you did in the past and break this up and bring us back to a place of considering that we are a healthy, growing nation, that, that we are healthy partners to other nations in the world. Now, God is with us. How is God with us in this? We are God with us, the body of Christ. The, the church is God with us in this. You and I to each other. And so there's a passage from 1 Corinthians, and the reason I mentioned how thankful and blessed I am that this church is a church in order and love of one another is because the one in 1 Corinthians was having great squabbles. Attend to the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in Him, in speech, in knowledge, and every, of every kind just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will all, he will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus shows up, we'll be blameless. We shouldn't be afraid to call his name. God is faithful. By Him you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What a glorious Word of God. We're in a season of faithfully waiting and watching for this one to appear. Uh, my wife Molly and I came to New Orleans on a mission. I didn't know that this was part of the mission. <laughs> but, but, but we came for, to help with a little fellow named Elliot. Uh, Elliot now is almost two and a half years old. 
He's quite entertaining. Uh, and we are with him two or three days a week. It's a blessing. <clears throat> uh, how many times we watch Rio? Uh, twice a day for, anyway. Well, I'm going to give you the good news is that there's a sequel, and Elliot has it, and it's called Rio 2. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details about Rio or Rio 2, but the first time that I saw Rio 2, just a few days ago, there's a scene that really caught my eyes and ears. Tulio is the hero scientist, and Linda is the lady from Minnesota who was the owner of Blue, the, the hero bird of the story. Uh, and they are in the Amazon rainforest. Uh, Trulio and Linda are trying to stop the clear-cutting loggers who are threatening the habitat of the blue macaws. So that's the setup. And they have run amok. They have uh, done enough to get the ire of the loggers. And in this scene, Trulio and, uh, Trulio and Linda are tied together. Their hands are tied together around a large Brazil nut tree. And they're a few feet off the ground. It's awkward and uncomfortable. There's no help in sight. And that's when Linda says, as bad as this is, there is no place in the world I would rather be than with you, even if it's tied to a tree. And that's what God says to you. Amen.